Hi, everyone. Thanks, Christoph. Uh, so can everyone hear me? That's working. Yes. Yeah, it works. <laughs> OK, great. I have some, some technical issues this morning. So hopefully, it's not going to affect too much the, the lecture. We see that. <laughs> yeah, so as Christoph said, it's going to be the last part of this uh, free lecture uh, stuff. So the, this one will be about spin foam today, so mostly. Yeah, so again, I, I just want to emphasize that uh, please don't hesitate to contact me after the lecture. Some of you already did it, and um, I haven't uh, replied yet, but I, I will do it uh, very soon after this, after, after this lecture. So don't hesitate to, yeah, to contact me for questions on research on, on the course or on, on the PI uh, uh, and the perimeter and the PSI program. Also, um, the, at the first lecture, we started to use this Mentimeter. So for today, again, I'm going to use it a bit. And you will have to go on this website and use the, the, the code. This is just a picture of uh, at the first lecture who attended. And it's mainly PhD student. But we can see that we have a quite a diversity in terms of background. And even, I guess, within PhD students, you're maybe not all working in, in spin form or loop quantum gravity. So hopefully, yeah, I'm, what I'm going to tell can, you can still learn something from, even if you're an expert or if you're not an expert in, in, on, on the topic. So this is for today. And first, I would like to ask you to, yeah, think about what was the most inspiring or exciting thing that you learned last week at the school. And I'm not talking about this particular lecture, but just in general, I mean, all lectures are going to be in some way um, connected, uh, and uh, and it's nice if you if you take the time to just think about what you learned, what you what you liked about um, about last week. I think you you started to talk about black hole, uh, QFT on curve space time, in addition to the covariant phase space formalism and and the more basic course that I'm I'm doing. So please, yeah, share with everyone something you found great and exciting. And um, yeah, so again, to you, you need to go on this menti.com and then the code for today is, is written on the top of the, of the slide. So it's 96075353. I put it in the chat if did it. Oh, thank you, Steph. Yeah, okay, so nice about, uh, yeah, QFT, some black hole physics. You know, geometry, group averaging. Okay, it's a very different aspect of of uh, of the different courses. So, vacuum is not unique. Yeah, this is I guess coming from the shift on curve space time, implementing a function in the direct program. Nice. So we're going to. To summarize that today and see, um, yeah, what's next when we can do that for 4D gravity. Yeah. So today, indeed, we 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 use the Dirac program on the, in the first lecture, and we were able to apply it completely for 3D gravity. And uh, in the second lecture, we we started to apply it to 4D gravity, and we're going to see today. Yeah, where we are and uh, which other approach we can take to, to deal with the dynamics. And OK, I see that you have been, uh, you had many different kind of uh, topics. So I guess it's a very, it has been a very intense week with a lot of uh, learning. This is nice. Thanks for sharing, everyone. And um, yeah, so for today, what we're going to talk about is uh, so finish try to to go back where we stop at the so we apply the direct program to 4D gravity and we were kind of stuck uh, at the last constraint the scalar constraint that is the one the Hamiltonian constraint so today we're going to discuss a bit what the issue are with that one and what are the solutions that have been proposed to deal with this with this issue so in particular we're going to mention the master constraint and then go to the spin form model. Uh, in the spin form model, then I will take the 3D case again. I will go back to 3D just because the first uh, spin form model that was built was the Ponson origin model. And it's also the model that, in, that has inspired the 4D approach. Okay, so this is 
uh, what we're going to, and then I will mention a bit uh, the EPRL model that is a 4D spin form model, and it's kind of the state of the art in the, in the approach, or at least it's what is going also to be needed for you to, to discuss more advanced topic uh, that will be, uh, that will be uh, yeah, teach next week. So let me now change and go to, so I have to use Keynote, so I'm not, yeah. So uh, let's first summarize what we did last, uh, last week. So last week uh, for 4D gravity, the first step was to get to the correct classical variable, the, the Ashtekar Barbero variable. Okay, so A here is at the top of my slide is this Ashtekar Barbero variable and E is the flux. Okay, they are conjugated. And again, this is the canonical description of, of uh, GR written in terms of this variable then you also have some constraints. So we have the chaos constraint and then the spatial default constraint and the scalar constraint. Um, then because uh, as in 3D, what we, so, uh, what we did then as a first step was to smear this, these variables. And we obtain what, what is called the holonomy flux variables. And something that, was, what, that is fundamental at this stage is that the flux variable is non-commuting, okay? And so I spent some time giving some argument uh, uh, to see why it is not uh, commuting. And this is really uh, an important feature because it's what makes that then we have a discrete area spectrum. And this is something fundamental that maybe you already used in the, in the black hole um, course that you have or that you will use for sure and also that you will use in the loop quantum cosmology approach, okay? And so then, uh, as you mentioned, we have, so what is gravity is a constraint system. So the way to quantize it is using the Dirac quantization program, where we first quantize the kinematical phase space. So here our kinematical phase space now are this holonomy flux associated to each edge of the graph that we're going to uh, uh, quantize, sorry. And then the idea is to impose the constraint at the quantum level. So the first step uh, is to get this Hamiltonian, the kinematical Hilbert space. And of course, by kinematical Hilbert space, we need to find the, um, <laughs> the space, but also the a measure, okay, an inner product. And something that I emphasized on the second lecture that was really different from the 3D case is that on, in 4D, you cannot focus on just uh, Hilbert space as a city to a given graph, because if you do that, you're just capturing a finite number of uh, degrees of freedom. You, you, it's a truncation of the full theory. And so you really need to go to this union of all possible graph and then take this projective limit, okay? So uh, what is key here is that the kinematical Hilbert space of loop quantum gravity is a continuous uh, Hilbert space, okay? Then we were able to impose the Gauss constraint, so we didn't do it in details because it's very similar to what we did in the 3D case. And what we obtained was this uh, spin network state. Okay. Um, so at, at this stage, maybe before moving forward, what I want you to tell me is, uh, sorry, so I'm moving again, uh, because in fact, I had another question. So if I'm telling you spin network state, can you, like write one, two, or three word that is associated to, to, this, to this notion of spin network state, and then we're going to come back. What do you think when I'm telling you spin network state? What are the other maybe technical term, or I don't know, uh, to what, how do you yeah, define them? So I'll let you write few words, and then we're going to, to start the discussion on, because the spin network state are really the building block of the quantum gravity, and, um, Yeah, so I want you first to kind of um, think about <laughs> what these objects are before giving you again the summary of, um, so again, the spin network state we obtain once we impose the, the Gauss constraint. So it should be the same code as before. So you can just use the same um, <laughs> grain of space time, graph, spin decorations, Okay, very good. Boundary states, yeah, they don't have to. 
we're going to see indeed that in the in the notion of uh, spin form, it's going to be the boundary state, representation of SU2, intertwiners, edges, graph. Yeah, so indeed, when you have a spin network, a spin network is defined in terms of a, is, is a, is a uh, color graph. So the graph and each edge is going to carry some spin decoration that it's written, and each node is going to carry some intertwiners. And indeed, as I mentioned, this spin network state are obtained when we impose the Gauss constraint and the notion of intertwiner is really um, when we get what we, we impose uh, the Gauss constraint, okay? The invariant state. Okay, so quantum of volume, indeed we have a quantum of, uh, quanta, some quantum of volume associated to nodes now. Agents node, Klebsch Jordan coefficient. So Klebsch Jordan coefficients are going to be the intertwiner uh, in the case of a three valent vertex for simplex. Yeah, we're going to go to the notion of for simplex uh, in a bit. Operation. Okay, thanks. Nice. So indeed, so the more common words are edges, graph, intertwiners here. And so if I go back now to my, to my slide, indeed on the, on the side, I have this, this graph with some uh, edges that will be decorated by SU2 spin representation and the nodes are decorated by the intertwiner. And I've represented some uh, quanta. So some of you wrote this grain of space. Indeed here, what you have is that you have some atom of, you can see the spin network state as describing atom of space where each uh, node is carrying an area, the quanta of area, and each, uh, each edge, sorry, and each node is going to carry a quanta of volume. So this is kind of the, the picture we have at this, at this stage of uh, when we impose the Gauss constraint. So we, and the spin network state form a basis for the kinematical interspace with the Gauss constraint implemented. So then um, the second constraint we have to impose is uh, the spatial, so the vector constraint that is implementing spatial deformor deformorphism. And I didn't give the detail, we can impose it the same way by doing some group averaging. And then what we get is this notion of S not of abstract spin network, okay? So kind of telling you that now you forget that uh, in the first picture, your graph is embedded in space and now your graph is really space itself. And so we still have one constraint to implement, which is the scalar constraint. And if we have that, we should be able to define the physical Hilbert space. And of course, what is tricky at this, at this stage is, uh, so I'm going to explain a bit the difficulty and see um, what, what are the, the kind of solution that have been proposed to, to, to go around this, this issue. So first, um, before going to, to this, let me just remind you a bit how things have been developed. So give you a quick, very quick and brief and not complete at all uh, historical overview. So this is just a slide that I already gave you uh, last week because it thing that we, we, we discussed last week, it was the introduction of the HTK Barbero variable and then the notion of spin network state. And so all this was done by 1995. And so now we're going to move to uh, the next stage to the, to the dynamic. And already in 1996, Timan defined a well-defined and finite and anomaly-free Hamiltonian constraint. So this is already kind of a great result. And uh, in the next slide, I'm going to explain a bit quickly what the issue are with this, with this constraint, even if it's, we have a well-defined uh, operator. And so in uh, 2005, uh, Timan introduced the notion of master constraint that I'm going to review. On the other side, uh, the spin form approach was also developed. So the first spin form model was by Trevero. Uh, so it's a state system model. So it's kind of, you can see it as a regularization of the ponzano regi model that I mentioned to you, that is a, a spin form model for 3D gravity. But now the Trevero model is defined in terms of, uh, of a quantum group. So we don't have the issue of um, infinite that we could have in, in the Ponzano Regi model. And this Curevo model can be seen as a, as a model for 3D gravity with a cosmological constant. So this is one of the first model. And then from 1986, already there were some tentative uh, model for quantum gravity 
by uh, Eisenberger and in 19, uh, seven, uh, <laughs> 1987, sorry, uh, 97, the barrett crane model was, uh, was proposed. So this is a model that I'm going to describe quickly. And then the next one that I'm going to talk about is the EPRL model that was first described in uh, 2007. So of course, many uh, aspects of, uh, of the development of loop controllability or spin form are, are missing in my, in my quick overview that I have here, just to give you an idea of when things have been done. But of course, I'm missing everything related to loop quantum cosmology or to black hole physics and also many other uh, work that has been done in between uh, this year that helped the, the development of this of this model. But it's just to emphasize the few to give you a few dates to give you an idea of um, the yeah the timeline here of uh, what we're going to talk about today. And so here at the at the bottom I have some references that I've been using. Uh, again you also have some very nice book by Carlo Rovelli, Thomas Timan that are very complete but here are some references that you can find online and I gave you the archive number so it's very easy to to get okay so let's go back to this picture and now go to this notion of uh, scalar constraint okay so <laughs> this is what I'm going to talk now so first I want to uh, remind you the about the constraint algebra okay so here we have the the gauss constraint that is, and I'm reminding you the notion of smear constraint, the vector constraint, and the scalar constraint. And here is the algebra from by this constraint. And of course, all the difficulty comes from the fact that this algebra is not as nice as we would like. In particular, here the structure constants that we have in this in this bracket is written in terms of uh, is of field dependent. Okay, is field dependent. So we don't have a full representation yet of this of this algebra and this is um, really the issue that we have with the with the scalar constraint and in particular this algebra is not a, a league is not going to give a it's not a Lie algebra is not going to give a league group so even if we were able to find a representation of the scalar constraint here uh, we we may have some issue to define the notion of a physical inner product, because as you may remember in 3D, for example, the way we define the physical inner product was using this group averaging method. And the group averaging method is an only working for Lie algebra valued constraint. Okay, so this is something that uh, is definitely missing here. But let's still uh, mention what has been done by Thomas. As I told you, Thomas Timan was able to define a well-defined operator, quantum operator that is anomaly free. Uh, so this operator I denoted S hat is associated with the, uh, the scalar constraint, the smear scalar constraint. And something important is it has to be defined on the kinematic Hilbert space. It cannot be defined on the Hilbert space satisfying the DFO, okay? Because the uh, uh, scalar constraint is not def uh, uh, yeah, differ, spatial differ invariant, okay? So this is one first uh, difficulty. So what is then this, this constraint doing? This constraint, what it's doing is that it's adding an edge, uh, it's acting on nodes, and it's going to add edges, okay? The point here is that the edge that is adding a kind of spatial edges, we call them exceptional edges, because they're going to be this new edge here, are going to be invisible to the um, to the subsequent action of the constraint. Okay, so meaning if now so you act with your constraint, and now you want to act again on this new graph on your constraint, it's not going to consider this new v1 and v3 on our nodes. Okay, so it's only going to act again on the v. So at the end, what you're going to get is uh, so if I do some drawing here. Let's say that you have a, you start from a provalence node. Okay. At the end, when you're going to add some uh, edges, you're going to have this kind of fractal description. Okay. And you're going to sum over all possible. And so at the end, sometimes when we talk about uh, the action of, of the uh, scalar constraint on the node, at the end, we, we could talk about the notion of dressed node, okay? 
So here I had this four valent node. And now this notion of rest node is kind of taking all this um, contribution that can be of this of this form. Okay. So um, yeah, this is how the, this operator is, will be working. But so the issue that we have is that so first uh, we 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 are not able to to define a notion of physical in our product here, but also the notion of semi-classical limit is missing. Okay, and the first approximation that we add seems to indicate that it's not uh, going to uh, we're not going to recover general relativity. And really, all the complication that we we have for defining these operators, and uh, and this issue that I mentioned, are really coming from this constraint algebra. Okay, the only algebra structure of this. This is what we call the Dirac algebra that I rewrote here, and this is really at the origin of the of the complication. So this is one motivation for introducing the master constraint. And the idea of the master constraint is instead of quantizing the constraint individually, what we want to do is to use this constraint that you're going to impose all of them at the same uh, time, okay? So S here is my scalar constraint. And really the main motivation for the master constraint is really of technical nature, as I said, okay? It's to simplify, uh, and the, the simplification we're going to see are coming that now we, we will have um, a nice algebra, okay? It's really going to tri trivialize the constraint algebra. So imposing the, the master constraint is equivalent to impose the, uh, sorry, the scalar constraint for all test function, okay? Um, and so this means that m equals zero here really encodes the same constraint surface as the infinite number of Hamiltonian constraints, okay? And then what is the second property telling you here? It's going to tell you that um, m is going to select the same weak Dirac observable as the infinite number of uh, single Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian constraint, okay? So this is the two main results. And also what is um, nice is that now M is specially deformorphism invariant. And so in practice, what we have is that the complicated Dirac algebra is going to be replaced by a kind of trivial master algebra. So I didn't write it, but you can have now that uh, in fact, M with M is equal to zero. And you have that D, so sorry, uh, what I call V and M is also equal to zero. Okay, so this is really now a truly algebra. And so it's removed most of the obstacle that was, was coming from, uh, that we had previously with the Hamiltonian constraint. And um, so what was also used to, so I, here I'm, I haven't summarized all the results, but you can, um, what, is, uh, what was uh, obtained from using this technique is that um, now we have a, it's possible to have a rigorous proof of the existence of the physical Hilbert space. Okay, that was something that was missing uh, with just the, 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 sorry, the scalar constraint. And the expectation of this master constraint has been computing using current states and shown to to coincide with the suitable discretization of the classical uh, theory, okay? So again, we have this notion now of semi-classical limit that is here, that was one issue of the scalar constraint. And the master constraint has been tested in, in a number, number of systems. And also even in the, in the spin form model, we're going to, I'm going to mention that we, we kind of use this uh, similar technique, okay? At some point, we're going to impose a master constraint. And it also has been imposed, uh, applied in the context of loop quantum cosmology. So this is, uh, yeah, really nice. So it's only what I want to say about the master constraint because I want mainly now to focus 
on this other approach, so the spin foam approach to define the, the physical uh, Hilbert space. And so the main question we, we, what we want to address now for the spin format approach is how to make sense to, sorry, let's try to, <coughs> to make sense to this expression. Okay, so now given an initial geometry on a 3D or three-dimensional slice of space-time and a final one, okay, what is the probability of transition that we have? And so here, of course, this expression is really a formal expression, but uh, the idea of the spin form approach is to give sense to, to this expression. And so the first uh, try was by Heisenberger and Rovelli. And the idea for them was to write in the spin network basis and try to define the physical inner product between spin network states. Okay. So again, the spin network is a graph with some decoration. So now I'm going to call the link, the edges of the graph and the node, the vertices of the, of the graph. And so the idea of um, Heisenberger and Rovelli is that if we work in the spin network basis, can we express this physical inner product as a sum over spin network histories? And this would be what we call a spin form. So on the right hand side here, I'm I have been drawing a spin form so what is a spin form? A spin form would be then a two complex plus a coloring, okay? So a two complex is a set of uh, elements called vertices, edges, and faces, and of course a boundary relation among them that has, you know, that an edge is going to be bounded by two vertices and a face is bounded by a cyclic sequence of continuous edge. And so the coloring now, what is the coloring? The coloring is going to be an assignment of an irreducible representation associated to each uh, face of, of your uh, two complex, okay? And now each edge is, is going to, of the two complex, so in the bulk, is going to carry an intertwiner. So here, if you want on, on this graph, what you have is the boundary spin network, okay? So the spin network is still your graph carrying so the J and K and L are the irreducible representation associated to the edges of your graph. And then you can see that each edge is going to be, uh, yeah, to evolve, so they're going to swap a, a surface. And, and so you're going to have the surface now carrying some irreducible representation. Um, <laughs> so, Of course, we're going to see that the construction of the physical inner product uh, via just exponentiating the Hamiltonian constraint is just going to be formal, okay? Because as we said, the Hamiltonian constraint do not form a Lie algebra, and so they're not even self-adjunct. So in fact, mathematically to exponentiate, uh, exponentiate them um, and um, it's going to yeah, lead to some issue. So what we're going to see is that in fact, the approach to spin form model take a very different starting point that I'm going to describe in a minute. But uh, before that, let me just give you what is the local, uh, the main on that that we take for this building a spin form model. So this is the, this notion of local spin form amplitude. And so the idea is that uh, general spin form amplitude can be written in this uh, very general form where here, so we have a sum over all um, uh, to every coloring, okay, and two complex. And this sum is not going to be, I'm not going to talk about that today. It's more something that has been, it's not really well defined, but the group field theory approach is one way to, to deal with this, with this summation over all possible two complexes, two complexes. And so I let you, you will have a, a lecture on that starting uh, I think this week, maybe, yeah, maybe tomorrow by Ed. And so I, I guess he's going to, to mention this issue. So omega here in this, in this last uh, equation it will be a statistical weight. And then you see that you have a product of different uh, amplitude. So A of A will be the amplitude associated to the, to the faces. And as you can see um, of the two complex, and the, this is only dependent on the, why is it local? It's because it's only dependent on the 
GF that is associated to the, to the face, okay? To the representation associated to the face. Then you have a product of amplitude associated to the edges. And again, for each edges now you have, uh, it's only dependent on the locally, okay? So you have the intertwiner associated to the edge. And then on this edge, you have some faces going around. So this amplitude will be dependent on the uh, representation associated to these faces. And then you have the vertex amplitude that is also look dependent, de is uh, depending only on local um, uh, representation. And so what is important in this, in this expression is that what what this ends up is telling us is also that all the dynamical information is encoded in this in this vertex amplitude. That is what we, we expect. Okay. Uh, so really the idea here of the spin form amplitude is to define the dynamical probability amplitude of a state, okay, on, on a given uh, so a spin network state on a given 3D uh, surface, and then encode the whole quantum gravity dynamical content. And now the idea that what I want to, to tell you is how we're going to derive that, that an amplitude. So the starting point is going to be, uh, so if I have a partition function, okay, now what I want to show you is that we can derive directly this uh, local, so this way of writing the amplitude in terms of local amplitudes as if we regularize this covariant path integral, okay? So I'm going to give more detail about what is this regularization process here, but this is um, what we're going to do. And we're going to start doing that for the 3D case, because again, the 3D case is, well, first nicer to make some drawing. So it's easier to, to see a bit uh, what we're doing. And also we're going to use that. It has been used in fact, to define the 4D case. Okay, the for this mean for model. Okay, so here really, this is the aim, okay? It's to regularize this uh, path integral to write it in such a, in such a way, in terms of, as a spin for model, where here C again is going to be the, the two complex. And here, the mu here would be a measure term, okay? That has to be determined. Um, okay, so, Spin form model for 3D gravity, the, the, the path integral approach. So as I said, the, we, what we're going to build now is the so-called Ponzano-Regi model. And uh, we're going to do it step by step because really this is, uh, this has been used as a guide to build the 4D spin form model. And so this is also what we're going to, to, to do next, okay? To use it as a guide to build the 4D spin form model. So I remind you what is a formal path integral for 3D gravity. So it would be, uh, um, so again here, I'm going to do as in the, in the covariant approach, or a canonical approach, sorry. I I'm going, yeah, sorry. There are two questions about uh, mu factors. Yeah. So uh, the, what is a mu AE? Okay, so the mu here is a, is a measure term, okay? That would have to be, uh, Determine again. This is 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 kind of formal, uh, but um, yeah. So 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 I added this because you you, uh, you could. Uh, are you time. writing something? Sorry, not uh, right now. No. Okay, because two people were saying that they cannot see what you were writing. So I don't know if you were writing something that yes, we cannot see it. Okay, so yeah, I haven't write on this on this uh, slide yet. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Right. Okay, so yeah, the mu here, so you were talking about the mu here is, is just a measure, a measure term that again, this expression is, is pretty formal at this stage. So yeah, I'm not giving details, but it's something that you could expect, okay? So uh, here, let's start from the, the action. So we're going to use the first order action that we use for uh, the canonical approach. And again, something that I want to emphasize here is that what we're talking about here is Euclidean gravity. Okay. And without a cosmological concern. So maybe this uh, is something that is different from what you have seen with, in Mark lecture. So meaning that uh, 
these are SU2, the algebra valued object, okay, the E and the, and the F. So omega is, yeah, is the spin connection and E is, is a triad here. So something also that I want to emphasize at this stage is that what we're computing is really the quantum path integral, okay? So there is really high here. And as I mentioned, I'm talking about Euclidean gravity, but it's really, I'm talking about, I'm taking the metric to be Euclidean, but I'm not doing any weak, uh, weak rotation here, okay? So we're really talking about the quantum path integral. And this, the goal now of the next few slides is to really regularize and compute this uh, path integral to put it in such a form. Okay, so what is the first step? The first step of the regularization is to first um, replace or discretize the, our manifold, okay? And for that, we're going to replace M by a simplicial manifold. And in, even in our case, uh, so with of course a similar topology, so in, in 3D gravity, it's totally fine. We're not going to lose any information in putting the theory on the, on the, on the simplicial manifold, okay? Because it's topologic, of course, it's not the same thing in 4D, but in 3D, we can definitely do that. And to make things a bit simpler, I'm going to choose a triangulation, okay? So you could choose here a general simpl uh, simplicial decomposition, but I'm choosing a triangulation. So what is a triangulation? So I'm denoting it uh, delta three. So what I mean by triangulation is that we're going to took some tetrahedra and glue them together, okay? So this is my building block. So in black, this is the triangulation. And in blue, it's what it's a dual, okay? So um, the blue, so a tetrahedron is going to be dual to, to a vertex, and then each triangle of my tetrahedron is going to be dual to an edge, okay? As you can see in blue here. And then the segment of my uh, tetrahedron is going to be dual to a face, and the point is going to be dual to a 3D region. So uh, yeah, you have to, a one-to-one -one correspondence between these elements. So sometimes I'm going to denote, use the triangulation and sometimes use the dual triangulation. So when it will be the dual triangulation, there will be a, a small asterisk. So this will, will be the meaning. So in terms of notation, but this is going to become hopefully clear in, in a bit because, so now that we replace our manifold by a triangulation, what we want to do is to discretize the variable, okay? So we're going to discretize E, so the, the triad as a SU2 group element, uh, sorry, SU2 Lie algebra uh, element, and omega is going to be uh, discretized as uh, holonomy, okay? And it's uh, the holonomy going around the blue edges, okay? So on the dual. So the autonomy is, so this is E star here. And so you see that then I can go around every, so edge of my, or segment of my, sorry, of my triangulation, I will have a face, okay? And going around this face is what I'm going to, it's the way I'm going to discretize the curvature. Okay, so E, U of E here is really, so this would be E and you go around, you take all the edges, sorry, going around this, uh, yeah, so the, the drawing is here, take all the edges going around this, this segment of the triangulation. Okay, so again, the holonomy are along the edges of the dual triangulation and, um, Okay, so this is the way I'm going to discretize my variable. So now what we can do is to write the discrete action. Okay, so we, we discretize our manifold. On this manifold, so now we have a triangle or tetrahedra grouped together. So we can discretize the variable on this, on this triangulation and then rewrite our action as a discrete action. Okay, so this is the discrete action that I'm going to consider. And from the discrete action, now I can have a this notion of discrete path integral. Okay, so I'm not at this stage yet because I don't have this uh, notion of local amplitudes, but I have a notion of discrete, uh, discrete path integral now. 
and this is this thing is really annoying uh, going on my way all the time, but that's that's okay. So let me try to write still what are the measures that we're using here. So hopefully you can still read. So this is going. Uh, okay. So this is the. Okay. So I'm just going to use my own word and not write everything because. Uh, it's not working. So the the integration over the x variable, okay, you, you can use a Lebesgue measure on SU, the SU2 that is uh, like R3, if you want, isomorphic to R3. And then the uh, measure on the SU2 group, so the DGE star here is simply the R measure that we already mentioned in the canonical approach. Okay, so we kind of, this was the regularization path part, and now we want to compute it explicitly, okay? And get it to this, to this form. So this is uh, uh, the aim. Okay, so uh, the first step when we do this uh, regularization, this um, computation is we can first integrate over the X variable. Okay, we can do this because we can use this expression where here it's simply a delta over u. So u again is a SU2 group element here. And now I'm using a second step. I'm using again this uh, Peter Wright theorem when I can decompose my, or the Planchel decomposition, when I can decompose this delta over uh, representation. Okay, so here it's what uh, SU2 uh, irreducible representation. So here I've used now the Peter that I introduced in the first lecture, Peter Weil theorem. Okay, to, do, to go from this group representation to this spin representation. And so, yeah, this is now what I get from my uh, partition function where I already perform one of the integration. So I'm only left with the SU2 uh, integration. So now I want to integrate over this SU2 group variables. And so what you can notice is that for each of these GE, okay, you're going to have, um, so as I said, GE of star, so you have a triangle here and of your triangulation. So this is in the triangulation and this E star is dual to this triangulation, okay? So this is a triangle of one of your own. And so you can see that if of GE is going to be, because now you have this U of E, okay? And you remember this U of E are this holonomy ground around the face of the dual, okay? So you're, you're going to have G of E star is going to be part of three different faces like this, okay? Because you have this one going around this edge. You have the one going around this other edge here and the one going around this other edge, okay? So for each G of E star, what you have is that you really have three DG, DG um, yeah, matrix element coming out. And you should, and again, I try to uh, represent that on this drawing, if you can see. So here is my tetrahedron, and for my tetrahedron for each face, I have this G that is appearing, going to appear three times. Okay, so, uh, and this formula should be familiar to you because we already seen it in the, in the 3D uh, model. Sorry, I have this. And uh, if you remember what we got was a 3G symbol here. Being your symbol that, uh, so I'm not, um, I'm not giving again the definition but if you remember, so this is exactly the way it is defined. This is simply some recoupling theory. And uh, what we get, and but again, this uh, 3G symbol, if you want, are related to the klebsch jordan coefficient. Okay, maybe you're more familiar with klebsch jordan coefficients. Just as a reminder, uh, you have a relation between a 3G symbol and the klebsch jordan coefficient. And so if you see now, when we're doing this integration over the GE variable, what we get is that now on each face of our triangulation, we have this intertwiner, okay? If you remember this 3G of the uh, three-valent intertwiner, it, they are uniquely defined up to normalization. 
And in fact, you have two of them. You have the one and it's, it's dual. But again, uh, here it's just one building block of your triangulation and then you're gluing uh, yeah, tetrahedra together. So we're going to glue these, these things together. Okay, so this is, uh, now we perform the two integration we had. So now can we put all these ingredients together? Because of course it's not for only one tetrahedron that we're doing that, we're doing that for the all tetrahedron. So what do we get? So now if first we, so for each phase of, let's still focus on one given tetrahedron. So for one given tetrahedron, now on each phase, you can see that you have an intertwiner coming from the inter in integration over the, the G variable. And so if you combine them, they correspond to the four triangle of your triangle of your tetrahedron. Then what you're going to get, you can combine them. And again, it's some recoupling theory, SU2 recoupling theory, you get this notion of six G symbol. Okay, this is exactly the expression of, of the six G symbol. And so how you can you see that? What you see here is that the intertwiner that are associated to the four triangle of the tetrahedron, they are glued together, if you want, into one spin network, which defines the quantum state of the boundary of the tetrahedron. Okay, so now it's at the boundary of the tetrahedron. And in this case of a, of a tetrahedron, the spin network dual to this original tetrahedron is also a tetrahedron as it is represented in this, in this drawing here. You see that the dual one is still a tetrahedron. And so by combining these four normalized Klebsch gradient or this 3J symbol corresponding to these four triangles, what we get is again, this well-known object, the 6J symbol that is now associated to uh, the segment of the of the tetrahedron. Okay, so the J are the representation associated to the to the segment of the tetrahedron. So what is the picture we have? Now we're almost done. Okay, so we first regularized our expression, our partition function by discretizing discretizing the manifold, discretizing the variables, discretizing then the, the action in terms of this new discretized variable. And then we were able to do an explicit computation by integrating first over the X variable and then over the G variable. So now we are at the stage that for each tetrahedron, what we have is a six G. So this is, uh, so now we, we got what is called the Ponzano G amplitude. And this is written in the form that we wanted. Okay, it's local because now for each tetrahedron that is dual to, to a vertex, so this is what we call the vertex amplitude, we have, um, we have a 6 J symbol that again is encoded all the dynamics of the, of the theory. And if you remember what we did in the 3D case for the canonical approach, uh, we solved everything. And then I was solving the constraint the flatness constraint for, for a given um, spin network that was associated to the tetrahedron. So you could have seen this tetrahedron as the discretization of like a, as a spin network associated to, to a spherical uh, 2D surface. And uh, imposing the flatness constraint in this canonical approach was also giving you the stick J symbol as a, as a physical state. Okay, so we recover at least yeah, we recover the same object. And here again, the 6 symbol is associated uh, to the tetrahedron and it's, it's encoding the dynamic of the, of the theory. So let's um, see why. So initially this model, of course, here we really started by regularizing the, the gravity uh, partition function so we really expect that indeed Ponzano Regge is a model of quantum gravity, but the, the way it was first built was, was not uh, for quantum gravity, it was finding some uh, topological invariant. And, and then the way it was related to, to 3D quantum gravity was by taking the semi-classical limit and showing that it was related to what we call the Regge action. So let me just uh, maybe first emphasize so here by semi-classical limit, what we're taking is this large spin limit, okay? And um, indeed, if you remember from the uh, length operator, 
we can interpret SU2 irreducible representation of our length, okay? We add that the length associated to an edge was given, so the, the spectrum was given by the spin. And of course, if we don't forget about uh, the, the units here, we have the Planck length here. And so the Planck length, um, if you want, this is in 3D simply given by J. So the Newton constant and the uh, Planck constant. And so the large spin limit for a fixed length, okay, is equivalent to make H bar here going to approaching zero or L, the Planck length approaching zero, okay? So this is why, yeah, we take that uh, the large spin limit can be seen here as a uh, semi-classical limit, okay? Because it's if you, if you say that the length is fixed, the same thing to take J goes to infinity or LP or H bar goes to zero. Okay, so, uh, so this, again, this object, the 6J is what is associated to, to a given tetrahedron. So it's the vertex, it's giving us the vertex amplitude dual to a vertex in the triangulation. And we get this result. So V here is the volume of the tetrahedron. And S of R, again, is the rejection, as I was saying. So again, uh, what do we have? How is it written? So the rejection is uh, a discrete description of, of uh, gravity. And uh, theta here is a dihedral angle of the edge E. And so it's the angle between the two uh, outward normal associated to the face. So you have something maybe like this. So you have two faces, sorry. Um, whoops. And so the diodron angle will be the angle between the two outward normal that you have of the two faces incident to, to that given edge. So here will be my edge E. Okay, so this is the what we call the diodron angle and L here is uh, again, is the length. Um, okay, so this is what we get from uh, the quantum origin model. So now I think it's just one hour. So I just want to take the time for you to maybe uh, tell me um, what we, you have learned just from the construction of this 3D quantum origin model. And then I'm going to move to the 4D case, but we're going to use a bit what we what we just did. Okay. So it can be anything that um, about yeah how the construction is done, what is possible, uh, what you think make the the construction work, or maybe what you think could be exported to the 4D case. If it's uh, so, we had two two stages here: the regularization part and then the computation part. And again, we started just about 3D gravity that is a topological model. Okay, so of course this will be something different in 4D, 4D gravity is not topological, but um, we're going to see how we can, we can use what we just did to, to export that to 4D. Again, yeah, any BF theory in, in any dimension is uh, going to be, um, is topological, okay. And here we have that 3D gravity is the BF theory, but you can write BF for more dimension. Okay, so is the Pondano region model invariant bench change of discretization? Yeah, very good. So we can indeed do, so uh, topological invariance is implemented. Uh, you can check it explicitly by doing this change of, um, of triangulation by doing the, the so-called Packner mode, okay. Uh, Mighty? Yeah. There is a question in the chat. Someone was asking basically the same question that was asked uh, in your mentee. It was, uh, sorry, 
I lost the question. But basically, the Poisson already model was uh, in Lauren batches of uh, discretization. I answer yes. Um, he said that I'm not sure here. So only triangular discretization led to the semi. Okay, basically, discretization, the semi classical. Oh, sorry, there is a typo in the question. Basically, can you uh, recover the regi action with something else than triangulation? Yeah, you can uh, define it for any simplicial geometry. Here, it's just like here. I, I, uh, so it has to be a simplicial uh, decomposition, but uh, it doesn't have to be a triangulation. Yeah. And mm. can we add matter to the model. So there have been, uh, yeah, uh, point particles or defects that have been added to. Uh, to point and origin models. This was done by uh, Laurent Fredel and um, David Luap. So I could, uh, yeah, I could uh, add some references at the end of the of the slide that for that could be helpful for answer some of your of your questions that you have. Um, I think some someone is interested in having a reference for the proof of the invariant of the point and origin model and their challenge of okay and the the Packner moves. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah, so the amplitude is not zero. So again, it's um, it's the same that we uh, what we expect is that at least from the canonical approach is because the the the, the phase space the physical phase space is zero dimensional. Indeed, we expect that you only have uh, a unique physical state, and it's what we found in the uh, when we did the three D canonical analysis of and quantization. And then we impose the flatness constraint on this uh, on this tetrahedral uh, graph on this tetrahedral spin network, and we found that there was a unique physical state that was the, the six G symbol. Uh, triangulation and it's dual. Uh, yeah. So for the um, transformation under conformal. Uh, symmetry. So here, yeah, and again, so there are a lot of um, interesting results that have been, uh, yeah, um, obtained in the last in the last year, in particular on on holography, and I could also give you some uh, reference here. When the action and distraction the best become, yeah. So here, yeah, maybe something that I can emphasize with this comment on the. We find the action and the action and the triangulation, the pattern they call become discrete as a result. So again, in in the loop quantum gravity framework, we find that uh, we have um, the area is discrete, but is is it is as a as a, the area spectrum is discrete. But this is a result coming from the theory. It's not the discreteness is posed by hand. Here we kind of use this result because we use this discretization to regularize the uh, the, um, the path integral. Okay, so yeah, thanks everyone for uh, for sharing your questions and um, uh, and for the comments. So I will add some references for some of the questions about the invariance under Packner move and the matter in, in the model and also the, the conformal invariance here. But let's now maybe go back to the presentation and uh, look at what we can do for the 4D case. Ah, something, yeah, I wanted to mention before um, moving to the 4D case is that in, in 3D also what is nice and is that we have an equivalence between the two approaches. So here I'm talking about the spin form approach and the loop quantum gravity approach. We also have some equivalence with some approaches coming from Charles Simon. So this is also what is uh, kind of interesting with the 3D case. And um, the equivalence of spin form um, model. Sorry, Christoph, are you? Yeah, sorry. Do you have a question? Or? No, no, I, I have nothing to say. Sorry, I forgot to get my. <laughs> That's, <Sorry. okay>. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so, and this equivalence uh, has been shown first by Karim Nui and Alejandro Perez in 204, where they really uh, implement. Um, the Hamiltonian constraint as, as a projector and shows the equivalence with the spin form model. Uh, later on, Valentin Boson and Laura Fredel did another approach that is also kind of nice and shows the equivalence by doing some, um, yeah, showing that um, 
you can get some interesting recursion relation for the Hamiltonian constraint that is, uh, and this recursion relation defines uniquely the, the, the Ponzan already amplitude, okay? So these are some results that exist in 3D. We won't have that in, in the 3D case yet, but uh, this is uh, something I wanted to, to point out. Um, and so now, yeah, what can we use for the, from the 3D case? So what we've seen in the 3D case, so indeed this was not an easy question that I asked you, it's not, uh, it's not obvious because uh, mainly what we're going to use, what is that we know how to quantize, we know how to discretize and quantize uh, topological theory, BF theory in a spin form model. Okay, so this is what we're going to use. And so for that, it means that we first need to reformulate uh, gravity. We're not going to use the formulation that I use in the canonical approach. So neither the metric formulation where then we, we went to ADM and we did the change of variable to go to Ashtekar Barbero, neither the first order formulation with the Palatini action or the old action when you add this uh, immersive parameter. What we're going to start with is another action is uh, the, because what we want to do is really write for the gravity as a topological theory, of course, plus constraint, because we know that for the gravity is not, um, is not uh, topological, so we, we will have to re-implement the geometrical degrees of freedom by uh, imposing some constraint. And so what is the strategy? When, if we are able to do that, then what we're going to do is to discretize the classical theory by putting it on a cellular decomposition. So as we did in the, in the 3D case, okay? So we're going to discretize our manifold and discretize our variable and write uh, a discrete action, okay? Then what we're going to do is use the fact that as in 3D, we will be able to do that for any dimension, we can quantize the topological BF part of the discretized theory, okay? And then we're going to impose the constraints at the quantum level. Um, so this is the strategy. And so first, let me just, um, tell you how we can write gravity as a topological theory plus constraint, okay? So this is the so-called Plebansky action that I'm writing here. So B now is, uh, <laughs> is a two form, is a SO3, uh, SO3 one. So I'm going to talk about the Lorentzian case. You can also do the Euclidean, so it would be SO4 for Euclidean, uh, the Euclidean signature, but we can do that for the Lorentzian signature. So since it's kind of a bit more, uh, what we are interested in, since it's uh, more physical, let's, uh, let's do the, the Lorentzian case. So omega here is a SO31 valued one form, and B will be a SO31 valued two form, okay? So you see that I have this B wedge F, that is my uh, B, yeah, BF part, as it's, it's kind of obvious, and I have this second term, that is going to uh, impose the constraint, okay? The lambda here are the Lagrange multipliers. So let's see uh, how we recover uh, gravity from, from this action. So if you look at the equation of motion, the last one, when you vary the action with respect to the Lagrange multiplier, what you get is the constraint. We're going to see that these are the so-called um, simplicity constraint. And uh, to solve this constraint, you can solve them. Uh, there is a solution to this constraint if there exists uh, a tetrad field, that as the B field can be written either in this form or in this form. So here you see that you have uh, two solutions. And in fact, the gravity part is when you take the, this sector with the plus sign, so you can check that if you replace now B by this expression, what you're going to, in this uh, Plebansky action, what you're going to recover is the Palatini action, okay? But so you see that, um, sorry. The Plebansky action is, is more than just gravity, okay? You have these two sectors. Of course, classically, it's always possible to distinguish uh, between them. Uh, at the quantum level, it's not, uh, so obvious that we can avoid these inter interferences, okay? Especially that in fact, you have at the level of the 
palette in action, you have a, you have a, yeah, you have a Z2 times Z2 uh, symmetry that yeah, seems to indicate that it's, it might be difficult to, uh, to avoid interferences at the, at the quantum level. But at least, yeah, this is something you, keep, you need to keep in mind is that the starting point is this Clemency action. You can recover gravity, but it's a bit more than gravity. Okay, you have this two, two sector of solution. Okay, so now let's talk a bit more about this simplicity constraint, okay? Because as you said, the, the first part is going to be uh, to, so I'm not going to do all the details of the discretization. I'm going to explain a bit what are the discretization of the manifold, but then the variable, I'm not going to explain all the details. And then it will be very similar to quantize this, this part of the action, of course, once it's discretized, as we did in the 3D case. And then all the difficulty is going to come from how to implement this constraint. Okay, so I'm, again, I'm going to write that in a, in a discrete way, and we're going to see how we can uh, import them. Okay, so the first step was to write the 4D gravity as a topological theory plus constraint. So this is done thanks to the Plevansky action. Now the next step is to discretize the classical theory by putting in on a cellular decomposition. So I'm going just to do uh, using, again, uh, <laughs> triangulation. So it's a 4D case. So now uh, my main, my building block are going to be four, four simplices. So I'm going to glue four simplices together. A four simplex is uh, built from five tetrahedra. And then, uh, so a four simplex now is going to be dual to a vertex. The tetrahedra is going to be dual to an edge. Etc. So you have again this map between uh, the, the triangulation and the dual triangulation. And when we discretize object, usually we're going to label this discretized object either using the, the triangulation or the dual triangulation because it's sometimes more convenient to use one or the other. Okay, so that's why you need to be kind of uh, have in mind that you have both and you can go from one to, to the other. Uh, another thing here is that, yeah, so here it's really the dual triangulation. At some point, we may need to use the dual uh, boundary triangulation, but uh, yeah, I won't. Uh, this will be for later. So this is uh, just the triangulation and the dual triangulation. So on the on the right here is it's just displaying a, a four simplex. And if you want, you this would be, for example, giving you uh, one tetrahedron and you have five of them. Okay, so then what we want to do is to quantize the BF, uh, topological BF part of the, of the discretized theory. So this is the BF part, okay, without the constraint. And it's very similar to what we did in the 3D case. So I won't do it. You first need to discretize, of course, your your variable. So here the two form is going to be now associated to the dual phase. Okay, of uh, so or if you want to the triangle of your of your discretization, triangulation. And again, the curvature is going to be discretized as the product of the holonomy around going around a given um, a given phase. So we have a very similar expression, as you can see, and we, we are able to do the same thing as before, okay? Do the integration over the B and then do the integration over the, the G. Uh, when, if we do that now, what we're going to get is, um, instead of, so if you remember when we did all the step of the 3D case, at the end, what we got was this um, object written just in terms of uh, SU2 spin representation, the 6J symbol that was associated to, um, to uh, tetrahedron, sorry, to tetrahedron. Now the object that we get is a 15G symbol. And indeed you have the 10 irreducible representation associated to the edges and the nodes are going to be decorated by, so you have five of them and they're going to be decorated by, the, uh, by some um, intertwiner. Okay, so 10 plus five is going to give you this 15. And this is associated to each four simplex of your triangulation. Okay, so then 
so, so yeah, this is something that we know how to do it. If you want to do explicit data calculation, it would be very similar to what we did in the 3D case. So now the question are more how to impose the simplicity constraint at the quantum level. And here, I'm just giving you some references for uh, what has, has been the main result. So the first one was done by Barrett, uh, the Bar it's the barrett train model by so Barrett and Crane, uh, quite uh, early in the development of uh, Swinfo model. And then more in uh, 2000, uh, 2007, uh, the EPRL-FK model was, was built. And um, so these are the main two models that I'm going to talk about today. So without giving too many details, but kind of explain uh, where the differences come from, what are the issue and what are the difficulty here. Okay, so again, we're going to go back to this notion of simplicity constraint to see why it is uh, not so trivial to impose them at the quantum level. And so for that, let's talk a bit more about the simplicity constraint. In fact, you can, um, so here I'm representing again, a four simplex. So what are the simplicity constraint when we have discretized our variable? So again, the B is discretized. So the B field here is discretized. That is a two form is discretized on the, on the face of the cellular decomposition, okay? Which is the same thing as this or um, and so um, we can distinguish two main cases. In fact, there are three, but the third one is, uh, is, is, is automatically imposed if you add some closure constraint, okay? If you think that you're, so again, you can see that each, so this is a, this is a four simplex, okay? And you, now you can see that, uh, think about it as each uh, triangle of this four simplex, okay? as a B vector associated to it, okay? That is going to give us, in fact, the area and the, and the norm of the, the, the norm of the B vector can, can characterize uh, the, the area of this, of this uh, triangle and you also have the norm. Uh, okay, so this means that now you have a four simplex and on this four simplex to each triangle, you have a, a B vector associated to it, okay? This is a discrete, uh, variable. What are the constraints doing to this B vector? So the constraints are going to tell you that um, first, if you consider what we call the diagonal one, so you have epsilon B, B equals zero. This is kind of the expression, but here it's uh, B vector associated to the same triangle. Okay. And so what this constraint is telling you, the simplicity constraint is telling you for a given B vector associated to a triangle is that this B vector must be simple. Okay, so this is the first set of constraints that we have. But then we also have what we call the cross diagonal simplicity constraint. So these constraints are for two triangles that are on the same free cell. So in the case of a triangulation, it means that it's uh, two triangles that are belonging to the same tetrahedron. Okay, so if you can see on this drawing here, they're just sharing one edge, okay? And so here, what this cross diagonal uh, simplicity constraint is telling you, so it has the same form as, as B for meaning it's going to be of this form, epsilon, B, B, but now it's delta, delta tilde or prime equals zero, where the delta, this would be, Delta, this would be the orange one would be the delta prime. Uh, and so what this is telling you is now that the sum of these two B vector B delta plus B delta prime is equal to zero. Okay, so I'm sorry with this um, keynote thing. I know that you cannot see when I'm writing the, you cannot see the bottom, this is really annoying. Uh, but so this is to give you an idea of what this, simplicity constraint are doing. In fact, you have an additional simplicity constraint that would consider um, two triangles that are not part of the same three cell, but in fact, the, this B vector also has to satisfy another constraint that is not here, is namely the uh, closure constraint. So the sum of the B has to be equal to zero, meaning that they close to form a four simplex, okay? And this closure constraint, if you want, is the 
is a discrete Gauss constraint. So in the case of the Lorentzian um, spin form model, this is uh, the SL2C spin, uh, Gauss constraint. Okay, so it's imposing SL2C gauge invariance. Again, SL2C, yeah. So, uh, and so when this, uh, sorry, so I should go back to. Yeah, so sorry again, this, when this closure constraint is imposed, then the, the other simplicity constraint that I've not written here is to automatically, automatically satisfied. So what you have to deal with in this model is this closure constraint and the diagonal simplicity constraint and the cross simplicity constraint. So yeah, so this was to give you an idea of what these constraints are doing. Okay, they are really constraining. So now you, what, where are we? So we, we, we started from this new way of writing uh, gravity. So using the Plebonsky action, which is a BF theory plus constraint, we know how to, we can discretize this uh, action because we can discretize the manifold, we can discretize the variable. And so we put everything on a cellular decomposition or more simply, yeah, here with the drawing, it's really a triangulation. We will be able to quantize the topological part, BF part of the discretized theory. It's really what we did in the 3D case. And now we want to impose the simplicity constraint at the quantum level. So here I'm giving you kind of what this simplicity constraint at the discrete level more or less are doing. Okay, so here in fact, the, um, yeah, what I wrote in red is more at the discrete level. There is no hat yet because we, we don't know how to impose that at the, yet at the quantum level. This is going to be the tricky part. But at the discrete level, this is what uh, the simplicity constraints are doing. Okay, they are doing putting some constraint on the B field, and you can really see that uh, you have a kind of nice geometrical interpretation of this constraint, if you want, or at least you have a geometrical understanding of this constraint on a given uh, tetrahedron. Um, and so now the issue that we have is that, in fact, this cross diagonal simplicity constraint our second class constraint. Okay, so here, let me just remind you this notion, this distinction between first class versus second class constraint. So if you consider a system with constraint that I did not uh, this tag here, the first class constraint are going to be such as their Poisson bracket with every other constraint needs to vanish weakly. Okay, again, weakly mean that it's vanishing on the, on the constraint surface. And so now if you, you know, by X is the remaining constraint, you want that this is forming an invertible matrix. And these are what are the so-called second class constraints. So, okay, so up to now in the canonical analysis of, of 3D gravity, we only had to deal with first class constraint. And the first class constraint are the constraint generating the gauge symmetries. So now when we go to this new formulation of, of gravity as a BF theory plus, plus this constraint, this simplicity constraint are not all first class constraint and you have to deal with some second class constraint. And usually we, we prefer to deal with second class constraint, we solve them at the classical level and then, and then we know to quantize. But here in this procedure, what we do is that we want to first quantize the BF part and impose all the constraint at the quantum level. And this is uh, why it's not so, straightforward to impose this simplicity constraint. So how to, to do that? So there have been, and all the, so I gave you a list of different models uh, in the previous slide about, and this different model, what change is not all this until here, it's the same. It's really how to impose the simplicity constraint that is now different between the different models. Okay, this is quite straightforward. Uh, it's uh, simply what we did in the 3D case. It's well understood and it's well done. And we know how to do it. Now the tricky part, and it's still, or at least, yeah, not clear that it has been resolved is how to impose the simplicity constraint at the quantum level. So the first uh, model, as I said, was the barrett kahn model. And uh, what they did was to impose all the constraint strongly. So what do I mean by strongly is uh, as, as an operator on, on the state like this, okay? So C would be all the simplicity constraint and you impose the, them as an operator and you find the state that, uh, that annihilates this, um, these operators. What they got at the end is, uh, was, um, so again, I remember that the aim is to write the partition function under this form, okay? Where, as I mentioned, we are mainly interested in the, 
in the vertex amplitude because the vertex amplitude is the one that is going to encode all the dynamical uh, content information of the theory. Of course, I, I haven't mentioned that all these terms are going to come from, can be seen as, a, as coming from the measure term if you want. And in fact, they are non-trivial non and not easy to, uh, to determine and they, they may change the theory, but most of the work that has been done for spin form model was to, to, to determine this uh, vertex amplitude, again, because it's where the dynamic of the, of the theories is, is encoded. So by imposing this constraint, the barrett can model can be written under this, this uh, form where we, we have this uh, product of, uh, of different amplitudes. And the vertex amplitude is given by a new um, object from SU2 recoupling theory or SO4, like now we are working, sorry, we're working with either SO4 or SO31. So, uh, but what you get is a, a 10J symbol. Okay, so uh, the J will be the, the representation of the, the group that you have. And so now how to, to test if this, this, this model, if the dynamic encoded in this, in this vertex amplitude is really giving us gravity or not. So the first step to do is to look at the semi-classical limit of this object as we did with, uh, in, in 3D where we looked at the class, semi-classical limit of the 6J symbol that was the vertex amplitude of the Ponzan Regi model and see that the 6J symbol was related to the Regi action. And this, we were happy with that because the Regi action is is a discretized action for gravity. So now, uh, can we take the limit here, uh, similar limit, and see what we get? So we can do that, and what we get is two different terms. And the first term, um, this first term, has a regi action, has a Ponzano regi. But the issue is coming from uh, this other term that is, in fact, dominant when j goes to infinity. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's dominant. So the, the rejection is, is kind of, the term in the rejection is suppressed. Okay, so uh, when the semi-classical limit of this model was kind of understood, uh, if you want now to compute kind of uh, some notion of graviton propagator and this kind of thing because of, yeah. Uh, so this was, um, the, the, this was, was an issue. And in fact, it seems that the way the constraints are imposed is that by suppressing too many degrees of freedom, okay? So is there another way to impose the constraint to keep more degrees of freedom? And this is what uh, was proposed by the EPRL model, okay? To impose the constraint in a different way. So um, what is the EPRN model doing? So I, I put again the, the reference here, is instead of imposing all the constraints strongly, as I said, as a, as a, a quantum operation, a quantum operator acting on some state equals zero, is they're going to impose some of the constraint uh, weakly, in a weak way. So I'm going to, to explain in a bit what does it mean to impose them in, in a weak way here. And, um, but not all of them, okay? I, if you remember, I did the distinction between uh, diagonal and cross-diagonal simplicity constraint. So they're going to still impose the diagonal uh, simplicity constraint in a, in a strong way, and the cross-diagonal simplicity constraint are going to impose, be imposed in a, uh, in a weak way. Okay, so sorry. Just... <clears throat> The, what are um, the different steps done here? So here, C would be all the different uh, quadratic simplicity constraints. Okay, I remind you here, what was the, the, this expression? Yeah, it, sorry. So it's on this epsilon BB. Okay, so the, the diagonal will be when uh, delta and delta tilde are the same and the cross diagonal are when delta and delta tilde are two triangles from the same tetrahedron sharing just an edge. Okay, so these are the two kinds of constraints we're going to consider. And so in the EPRN model, they're going to keep uh, the same expression for the diagonal simplicity constraint, but they're going to rewrite the 
of the diagonal using a linear simplicity constraint written in this form, but as a kind of nice geometrical interpretation, it's telling us that all the faces uh, are, are um, yeah, lining in the same hypersurface. So it's, uh, this is the way they're going to rewrite the up diagonal simplicity constraint. And, and so then uh, when they have this constraint, so here it's written again using just, um, so the first step is here, they're already discretized if you want, okay? Because the B field are already um, discretized on the triangle of the triangulation. And then they are able to uh, quantize them. So to quantize the linear simplicity constraint, usually what we do is to choose a gauge fixing so xi is going to be chosen to be delta i zero. So that's why now you have a, a j that is uh, only yeah, taking three components. So you, you do first the gauge fixing here. And we are able to find, uh, yeah, to, to have that as an operator. So now how do we input them? So as I said, we're going to impose again the uh, diagonal constraint as a strong equation. So they are still imposed strongly as it was done in the uh, Barrett trend model. But now we change the way the of diagonal simplicity constraint are imposed and it, they're imposed in a weak way, meaning that we only want that to find the state that has uh, this uh, matrix element are vanishing, okay? So we want to find all the states that has the matrix element of C are vanishing. So this is a way we impose this constraint weekly. And I'm not giving all the details, so, um, but now when we impose that, it's going to implement some uh, restriction on the, on the representation that we are allowed to, to use. So if now we want to have the, we are able to write the vertex amplitude for the Lorentzian model, so with SL2C. And so SL2C irreducible representation are given by, so N will be uh, alpha integer and rho is a, is a real number here. And you also have, um, so these are the SL2C representation and you also have some SU2 representation, okay? Because here, what you have is a fusion um, coefficient and this fusion coefficient, what they are doing is that they are uh, contracting some irreducible representation for SL2C with some uh, intertwiner for SU2, okay? So what is this uh, vertex amplitude? So it's written in terms of this kind of complicated form, but the important object is, again, we have a 15J symbol where we have some restriction on the, now on the, on the representation that, are allowed that, and this is coming from the implementing the simplicity constraint, and we have this additional uh, fusion factor. Okay, so this is a kind of um, complicated expression, and of course, what we are interested in now is in the semi-classical limit of this of this object. Okay, so, oops, sorry, I think I was missing one. So again, here, this has been done by the group of John Barrett to find the semi-classical limit of this, uh, this EPRL vertex amplitude. And what was found, so it was using some saddle point approximation. And what was found is that indeed you get the, the, the red J action. You have two terms, okay? So it can be interpreted as that you can have uh, the two orientation. Uh, so this is again, yeah, a discussion about the, the different, what, what is the meaning of this, of this two sign. There are also some discussion about the fact that indeed this is a vertex, this is a semi-classical limit for a given uh, four simplex, okay? So for a given building block, what happens now if you take many building blocks glued together, so many four simplices glued together. And again, this rejection is a rejection action written in terms of the area as, as a, Uh, fundamental uh, variable here. Sorry. Uh, okay, so the recording is starting again. Everything is fine. Yeah. 
you can go. It's fine. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and so, yeah, so I won't give more detail about uh, the discussion on this semi-classical limit on, on spin foam, but I think you're going to hear much more about that on the lecture on effective spin foam by Hal and Fed, because this is kind of one motivation to, to impose, um, yeah, to develop this uh, effective spin foam approach is also to, to deal with this, uh, yeah, this, the fact that here the semi-classical limit of spin foam is given again by the rejection in terms of area um, variable, and um, and there are many questions about how to get uh, to get the length configuration. Uh, can this be reduced to the length configuration? And so, yeah, this is something that will be discussed in this effective spin foam lecture, I think, by Hal and Seth next week. So I'm going to stop here and I'm happy to take uh, questions. So thanks for your attention. And I'm going to add at the end of this slide uh, for when it will be posted on, on the thing, some references that could, uh, uh, yeah, that uh, would be useful for the question that you have been asking, so. Thank you, Maite. Uh, there are already two questions. I think on the slide just before, Ongwe asked if uh, Psi here is a spin network state. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, you impose that on the, so here Psi, indeed, I, I, I did that kind of a bit uh, <laughs> uh, by, by, and I didn't um, give all the explanation for, for the notation, but yeah, you would, um, you would apply that on the, on the, on the spin network state and it's going to, um, to to constrain the, the the representation that is allowed on the on the on your state because so here but the spin network state again so the the B field uh, if I go here yeah I didn't write them but as I mentioned you, in addition to the simplicity constraint you also have that the B field need to to simplify to um, you have the the closure constraint. They need to satisfy the closure constraint, and the closure constraint are going to impose uh, the the gauge invariance. Okay, at the for SL to C here, uh, so the the Lorentz gauge invariance. So again, the, you're going to find the SU two at the for the in, SU two intertrainer for the boundary states. Okay, uh, there was a second question by Melissa Rodriguez. Uh, we should be able to ask the question ourselves soon. Now, Melissa. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, so yeah, I was thinking that maybe this uh, can be related or it can have an analog to what happens in, in quantum field theory, where you have a path integral and um, then you can get the propagators and have like something like Feynman diagrams. So I don't know if in this context, can we have Feynman diagrams? Because since we are like summing um, space times, I don't know if we can have something like uh, the notion of a Feynman diagram. Yeah, there is. An, and I don't know if uh, Ed tomorrow is going to mention that about in his GFT course, because um, so here I, I gave you kind of the usual uh, expression of the, of the spin form written in terms of uh, irreducible representation. So in terms of spin representation that has this local expression that is uh, written here, okay. Uh, but you could also write this, uh, this, um, this spin form as in terms of group element, okay. And then, uh, then this would make easier to, uh, to indeed go to the notion of, uh, of Feynman diagram using the GFT techniques. But you can show that indeed during uh, GFT, you can you can decompose that in terms of uh, some notion of Feynman diagrams. Yeah, indeed. But it's it's easier to see. What I just want to say is that it's easier to see not using the the, the notation that I've been using, or like not the notation, the representation that I've been using here. That is the spin representation. But it's easier to write this uh, spin amplitude, uh, spin form amplitude. Sorry, in terms of group. And then, uh, and then you can expand that in terms of uh, Feynman diagrams here. Yeah. Okay, I think I was a bit too quick with the, pre the previous question because Ongwe had a comment in the chat. He, he said that the definition of spin network is dependent on the ADM formalism and where do you import the ADM formalism? 
so sorry, can you? Sorry. The definition of spin network is dependent on the ADM formalism. Where do you impose the ADM formalism? So spin network, yeah. So I wouldn't say uh, on the ADM because ADM, you once you have ADM, so it's dependent. Maybe what you mean maybe is the Ashtekar Barbero variables, where from the ADM you still need to do a change of variable, and you write that. Uh, then you, you have this immediately parameter that is uh, the, that is coming into the game, but then the spin network states are really defined. You can really see. So the way I'm, when I'm talking about spin network state here, it's not really the way they've been built in the canonical approach. Is really at the level where now we have graphs that are decorated, and you have a spin representation on the edges, and um, intertwiner at the, at the nodes, okay, at the vertices. So this is what I call a spin network state. So for the when it's coming from the canonical approach, then you may be right that the, the spin network state is defined in terms of SU2 spin representation. Uh, whereas here, maybe your question is more, we, we're going to start from uh, so it's a covariant approach. So we're going to start from the SL2C uh, spin representation or spin four if we, we, we were in the Euclidean. And we would like to relate that uh, to maybe SU2 spin network state. And, um, and so here, yeah, maybe, yeah, few things that I haven't explained in detail. So first, there is the first thing that I mentioned, uh, when you go to from ADM to HTKR, you introduce this immersive parameter. So here it's not obvious, and you have the immersive parameter in, in, the, in the definition of the HTKR barbarian connection. So you have it in the definition of your on, on of your polynomies, and so it's playing all, for example, in the, in the it's appearing in the in the spectrum of the area, the area spectrum operator. So there could be a question first: how oh, the immersive parameter appear here? So you you have it, uh, you the gamma that you have here is the immersive parameter. So you can yeah you can um, when you discretize your variable, the b variable in fact. As the B vector associated to each triangle, you can choose a discretization that includes uh, the gamma parameter. And if you want the way you, you, you can incorporate it, is a bit similar to what we did when we were doing from coming from the Palatini action, where uh, we had this freedom to add this, um, this boundary term to get the Holst action that was uh, not boundary term, sorry, this topological term to, to, get the, to introduce the, the gamma parameter by hand. Uh, to get this uh, whole section and then do the, the, the canonical analysis here. When we do this discretization, we also have this, um, at some point we have, a, we can add a, a term that, and it's, it's a way to, to, um, to introduce this uh, gamma parameter that is, that is not fixed. So this is maybe one first aspect that is, was a bit hidden. And then uh, the relation between, uh, so SL2C spin network and the SU2 spin network, if you want. In fact, what, what has been shown is that the boundary state of, of the spin form are so-called uh, projected spin network. And the projected spin network has, uh, so it's, it could be a SL2C spin network with an additional um, norm associated to, to uh, an additional vector, so an additional variable associated to each uh, edge, if you, uh, sorry, to each node of your spin network. And we can show that when this is, um, when we fix this this norm, okay, when it's not a free parameter anymore, then it's reduced the SL2C reduced to, reduce to S, SU2 invariance, okay. So it's a SU2 subgroup that leaves this this norm uh, associated to the vertex uh, invariant, and so it has been shown that indeed the the boundary uh, state associated to spin network as this. Uh, in fact, it's better to talk about projected spin network instead of spin network. And then you have a very nice map between the projective spin network that are defined for indeed SL2C and the SU2 spin network states that uh, are the states that are defined from the canonical uh, approach, if you want. Okay, uh, there is another question. Uh, how the amplitude of the spin form for two complex compare with the amplitude of the spin form for four complex and how will it change going to higher dimensions? Um, I can say it again if you want. 
Yeah. <laughs> How is the amplitude of the spin form in two complex compared with the amplitude of the spin form in four complex? And how will it change going to higher dimensions? Okay, by, uh, so by four complex, it, it's, the question is related if we are higher dimensional manifold, not that is, we are not talking about 4D. Uh, I guess. Sina, if you want to add some more detail to your question in the chat or talk if you can. Yeah, so just about the higher dimension. So uh, my main question is that, thank you very much for your sorry. talk. My main question is that, how does the spin form amplitude actually change going to higher dimensions? So you mean not working in 4D or in, like I presented something in 3D and in 4D, you would like, yes. like any any dimension so how do the 3d and 4d compare to each other and what if i go in higher than 4d like okay so what i yeah so i don't have uh, much to say here so if anyone in the audience has something to add they are welcome um just what i can i can say is that uh, the topological part uh, i think uh, can be so the bf part can be uh, discretize and quantize, I would say, for any dimension. I don't know if this has been has been done or not. Uh, then the, the relation between 3D and 4D, um, I mean, the, the, the relation we have is, so here what I use is just I use a 3D case because you can, it's easy to, at least it was easy to, to present in terms of drawing its tetrahedra and group together. And it's topological, so it's anyway one part of the work that you have to do in the 4D case. So the again, the topological part, the way it is done in 3D and 4D is very similar, except that indeed the simplicial decomposition has to be um, has to be uh, yeah, adapted to your <laughs> to your dimension. So in the case of uh, of 3D, I work with a triangulation that is 3D, so it's tetrahedra. Uh, glued together in the 4D case, then you have a simplicial decomposition. I again choose the triangulation, so it's for four simplices glued together. And um, um, yeah, so the, I think the BF part is always uh, well understood. Then I don't know anything for yeah, gravity in other in higher dimension uh, for the spin form approach. But, to complement uh, my answer, Etera put the link of an article describing BF description, description of higher dimensional gravity theories by uh, Laurent Kirill and, oh, I don't know this name, the, the surname of this one. Oops. Thank you very much. And Melissa has another question. Melissa, you should be able to talk. Hi. Um, so Hi I, I was wondering if these um, either the three D or four D models have been UV renormalized, or what is the state of the art in this approach to renormalization? Um, yeah. So so the three D so the three D case indeed you have some uh, divergences here. Uh, so let me maybe go back. Uh, but this can be. Yeah, so the 3D case, uh, indeed, the, the 3G symbol here would be, uh, okay. there are some different, different uh, divergences, sorry, uh, that can be dealt with when you go to the, um, to the, to gravity, in fact, with a cosmological constant. And um, this is then what we call the Turay zero model. The Turay zero model is kind of very similar to what I wrote here, except that the spin representation would be, uh, representation of uh, the quantum group U, Q, S, U2, and uh, for Q, root of unity. And then uh, you will have, um, yeah, the, they can take only up to uh, finite value. So automatically uh, it's, it's going to, uh, it's going to, to, uh, to lead to, yeah, to, to deal with the, uh, with the problem of divergences, then it's not divergent anymore. So this is uh, what we call the Turay zero. Yeah, so this is the Turay zero. For the 4D case, I know that indeed the, the, 
there were some studies on this uh, kind of bubble diver diver divergences, sorry. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure what are the, sorry, the last result on, 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 this, uh, on these questions. So again, if someone in the audience wants to, to add something on the, on the 4D case, Uh, and again, Etera adds some more information for the higher dimensional case for spin foam. He said that it should be possible to write linear simplicity constraint in higher dimension too to replace the nonlinear constraint at Plevansky, leading to simple representation and a weak position. But I don't know if someone has actually done explicitly done it explicitly. Okay, thanks, Etera. Yeah, indeed. Uh... So, is there any? I don't think it's, it has been done explicitly. Other question? You want to raise your hand? Write it in the chat. No. So well, let's thanks Maite again for the lecture, and uh, we will see you tomorrow at two p.m. for uh, the last lecture of Alejandro Perez. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope to see you in uh, real life uh, very soon. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're in person.